Well, this morning, uh, I ask you to turn your Bibles to uh, Genesis chapter 35 and uh, title of this, Call to Revival. Before we get started, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I just ask you that you would just take complete control of this service, Lord. That it would not be any of us, Lord, but it would be all you. I pray for each and every heart that is here, Lord, that, Father, you would change it into your image. I pray, Father, you would change me into your image. I pray no one see or hear me, but they see and hear you, Lord. Father, I pray that you will be glorified. I pray that it won't be me speaking, but it will be you, Lord. Father, we need your help. We ask for it, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, when we hear the word revival, we think about things that happened a long time ago. Or we think about something happening in another country. Or we think about, ah, it happened over there a little bit, but it's not ever happened here. And we always think somewhere else. Why is that so? Why does revival so many times happen somewhere but where we're at? And when we think about this, we have to really look at the other stories. We have to look at why did it happen there? Why is it happening over there? Why, why, why? And it will never happen here and until we can answer the question, why? Several years ago, down in Pearl, Mississippi, in Pearl River, uh, there was a school, Central High. And a certain time of the week, they would have this meeting called FCA. Nothing special about this certain day, as they had done year, all year long. This was toward the end of school year. And they had their regular Bible school meeting with the FCA. But there was something different about that morning. Just something was happening. And there was a school that was about 600 and, 670 kids, the article says. 90% of the students showed up at the FCA meeting that morning. That's a lot of kids that showed up in the gym that morning to have FCA, a Bible study. The speaker gets up and starts sharing with the students. And they give an invitation. All of a sudden, students start getting up out of the seats. And they start filling the aisle, coming down to make a decision. The principal is standing off to the side of the stage and he looks around. He says, what in the world is going on? About ten minutes later, the bell rings for school to start at eight o'clock. And the principal says, do I stop this and tell them to get to class? The principal is looking at all these students coming down the aisle. He says, there's no way they're going to make it to class in time because the bell just rung. He says, I can't stop this. This is God. Student after student was coming down, making a decision. First period went. Second period went. Third period. Fourth period. Lunch. Students were still coming down, weeping, getting their lives right with the Lord, making decisions. For the rest of the year, they talked about how... This impact, that one day, that one morning, impacted that entire school. Then it started impacting the entire community. Then it started impacting the entire area there in Pearl River. Now I want you to catch this. It started with people desiring to get their hearts right with the Lord. That's where it starts. Revival starts when we choose to get right with the Lord. When we choose 
to surrender all to the Lord. Holding back nothing. Not saving a little bit over here for ourselves or for this situation or for that, but we giving it all to the Lord. I want to show you a little something the Lord teaches us in Genesis. Genesis verse 35. Verse 1. God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there. Make an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. There's a lot happening in that one verse. I'm telling you. There's a lot happening in that one verse that can happen in your life. There's a lot happening in that one verse that can happen in my life. And I want you to catch it. I want you to... Not to just catch it and release it. I want you to catch it and I want you to fillet it and I want you to fry it and I want you to eat it. I want it to come inside of you and change you. Because I'm going to tell you, this came inside of me and changed me. This is where revival can happen with us. Here's a call to revival given to Jacob. The Lord is calling Jacob to revival. You say, well, how is that happening in that one verse? Well, Jacob had got to a point he needed revival. Do you need revival? Do you really need revival? Most of you must not. You're not very excited about it. Do you need revival? That's something to be excited about. We'll see. But Jacob did. He had got to a point that he had got careless with his obedience to God. Jacob had said, well, I'm saved. I love the Lord. The Lord has spoke to me. The Lord has revealed things to me. The Lord has done this and that in my life. I'm going to sit back my lazy boy and just enjoy life. When the Lord the whole time was telling Jacob to do things, but Jacob had got careless with his obedience. Have you? Have you got careless with your obedience to the Lord? He had settled in a place of evil. Genesis 33, 18, it talks about where he went over to this place and he settled in and, and, and Jacob had, had just started just hanging out in this place as an evil, sinful place. And, and his daughters, they, they lived there. You see that in Genesis 34, verses 1 and 2. It talks about how his, how his daughters had settled over there in this sinful place. And where his two sons had started doing some uh, wicked deeds. And it all stemmed from this location where Jacob had decided to start settling. You see, Jacob had got to the point that he had got comfortable with his relationship with the Lord. How he got comfortable with everything going on and he just settled down. And he didn't realize where he was settling down. He is settling down in the middle of sin, in the middle of wickedness. Jacob had settled down in this sinful place. And this call to revival involves four things. And one of the things, the precept, the place, the purpose, and the priding. Look at the very first thing, the precepts in the calling. The calling to reveal came from, came in the form of the precepts of God. You say, well, what is that? That's the commandments. That's the Lord telling him to do something. Now check this out. A minute ago I told you about that, that revival that happened in Pearl River, Mississippi. At this high school. It all was based upon the Word of God. Many times we hear about revivals or different things happening. And we say, well, what happened? Oh, well, this and that was happening. Well, can you back it up with Scripture? Was the Word of God being taught? Was the Word of God being shared? Was the Word of God what was involved that started that whole thing? And if they say no. I'm going to tell you, I can't guarantee it's from God. But I can guarantee you that when revival starts and it breaks out and it starts changing lives and you can say it started with the Word of God, I can guarantee you it came from God. 
But you see, when you look at this part with Jacob, the Lord spoke to Jacob and told him to go do something. You see, that was the Word of God speaking to him. That was the commandment that he was giving Jacob. God's Word is always the foundation of spiritual revival. It can start in church, or it can start in an individual's life and their personal time with God. I have been times when I've been in church and the Lord has spoke to me and God revived my spirit and lit the fire inside of me, got, me on, got my passion going, I was refocused and I was ready to go. And then there's been times I've been in church, nothing. Was it the preacher's fault? Was it the music leader's fault? Nope, it was mine. I came in with the wrong attitude and I left with the wrong attitude. But when you come in with the right attitude and you leave with the right attitude, you allow the Word of God to penetrate you and change you. Then, another place it can be involved, it can start with, is with your personal time with God. There have been times that I have started reading the Word of God and all of a sudden it just coming off the pages. And God is saying, Wes, this and this is things you need to work on. This and this are things you need to change in your life. And when I was able to get up from that moment and be obedient to those commandments, those were times when the Lord used me. But if you don't open your Bible, you don't have that time with the Lord, how can He do a revival in your life? He can't if you don't open it. You're going to miss it. You're going to miss the precepts in the calling, when he's calling you to do something, you're going to miss those commandments. The second thing, place in the call. The place where Jacob was to go was Bethel. Now you see, he told him to get up and to go to Bethel. He was telling him to go do something. See, there was a call. This call comes before the action. Before we can act, the Lord has to speak to us and tell us to go do something. The Lord spoke to Jacob and told him to go do something. There was the call. There was the call. There are two significant lessons in this thing right here, and I want you to catch it. Bethel. Here's what Bethel means. House of God. Revival will put one in church. You want to see this church grow? You want to see your family members and your friends start coming into this place and sitting in these pews, sitting in those Sunday school rooms? Do you really want to see it? You let revival break out. But see, revival's got to start here with us. It's got to start with you. It's got to start with me. But when revival breaks out, these pews will get full. Those Sunday school rooms will get full. But it will only happen when revival breaks out. And let me guarantee you this one. You can count on it. You allow revival to break out into this place, I guarantee you these pews will get full and those Sunday school rooms will get full. And the Lord will be glorified. The second thing, the mount. Bethel is located on a mountain. Joshua 16.1, it plainly tells us about what Bethel is located. It's located on top of a mountain. It's a thousand foot above the area where Jacob was at. And remember that area I told you that Jacob was at and it was a sinful place? Shalom. Uh, uh, she- Shalom was where uh, he was located. And where, Je- where Jacob was dwelling... It was experienced the sin problem. You see, Shalem, where Jacob was dwelling, was a sinful place. It was down in the valley. It was down in the place far away from the Lord. But the Lord spoke to Jacob and said, Hey, you're somewhere you don't belong. You're doing things you're not supposed to be doing. It's time to get back to Bethel where you belong. And he called him to go. And he called him to go to the mountaintop. The Lord is calling you, he's calling me, and he is calling this church to get to the mountaintop. To get up out of the valley 
and to get back up on the mountain. Because that's where the revival is going to start. Revival lifts. It leads to higher ground. Sin lowers. It never rises up. Where's the sin level in your life? Is the revival level lifted up high? Is it lifting you up to that mountaintops? Or is the sin that's dwelling inside of you pulling you down? Pulling you away from allowing revival to break out in your life? Causing revival not to break out in your church. Break out in your family and your friends' lives. You see, sin pulls us down. It pulls us away from being obedient to the call in which the Lord is calling us to do. The purpose of the call. The next thing. The purpose of the call. The purpose is twofold. First, it involves a dwelling. Jacob was dwelling in Bethel. He needed to live in a holy place. What about where you live in? If the things around you, things of sin... Are the friends that you're hanging out with, that you're spending time with, the things you're devoted to, are those things pulling you away from God or are they pulling you toward God? Is your work environment, is it pulling you away from God or is it pushing you toward God? Because here's the thing. Where we dwell, where we live and how we live, it has to pull us toward God, not away from God. The Lord relocated Jacob. I mean Joshua. He relocated him from this. Oh, uh, it is Jacob. My bad. And uh, revival takes one out of an unholy place. You see, when revival takes place in our lives, it takes us out of that unholy place. It takes us out of that sin. Because when true revival breaks out in our lives, sin is no longer available to be there. It can't be there. It can't dwell there. Second, it involved an altar. Jacob was to build an altar there. That verse tells us he was to build an altar there. The altar was for worship. Revival is prompted by worship. When we truly worship God and not go through the motions, that is when revival can happen. But we got to quit going through the motions and we got to allow revival to take place. The altar also spoke of a sacrifice. See, the reason the Lord told him to build an altar there, there was about to be a sacrifice for the sins, for the wickedness that was going on in his life, in his family's life. True worship isn't without sacrifice. If we want true worship, we want revival to break out, there has to be a sacrifice. And that sacrifice has to be willing to give it all to God and give it all over to Him. There has to be a sacrifice. Next thing, priding in the call. God often accompanies His commandments with something that will inspire obedience to them. Now think about this. Now I see this a lot when students come back from camp. I see this sometimes with adults that get to go to a revival service or get to go somewhere that just God just had this huge encounter with the Lord. I get to see this when people just get saved. And you know what I'm about to say. They're all fired up. They're ready to take hell on with a water pistol. But within a few weeks, the fire's not there. Why? Why? You see, the Lord, when He changes us and He does a work in our lives, He gets us fired up. He gets us motivated. Why does He do that? Because He has these commandments. He has these things He wants us to put in our life. He wants us to do. And He knows us humans need a little motivation. We need a little excitement. 
And the moment we get motivated and we get excited, we will do it. Well, see, when he talked to Jacob, he said, Go to this place. Build this altar. Worship me. He's telling him, do this stuff. And and with all this, he is getting him motivated. He's getting him fired up that he will be obedient to go through it. But the moment we start getting our eyes off that obedience, off those commandments that the Lord wants us to do, is the moment we lose our fire, we lose our passion, and we just become the same way as we used to be. You see, we can't lose that passion. We have to realize the Lord is motivating us for a reason, and that's to stay true to Him. One thing happened here. He reminded Jacob of two things about the previous visit to Bethel. See, the Lord is about to remind him of something. And I want to share these two things He's about to remind you with. First one, He reminds him of a dream at the previous visit to Bethel. God appeared to Jacob in a dream which inspired the dedication to God. You see, the Lord started reminding Jacob, last time you went to Bethel, I spoke to you. I came to you in a vision, in a dream. You got motivated. You got got a desire in your heart. And you were the man that I was using. But you lost it. But all of a sudden, the Lord started reminding Jacob of what had happened. And Jacob started remembering the good old days. Those good old times when I was obedient. When I was faithful to the Lord, God started reminding him of that. And then all of a sudden, he said, oh yeah, I remember. I've lost it, but I remember. I want it back. I'm not going to settle. I'm not going to settle for second. I'm headed to first. Second, the danger. In the previous visit, God promised to protect Jacob when he was fleeing from Esau. God protected him. God didn't allow him to get killed. And all of a sudden, God reminded him, said, you know what? I was there the whole time. I had you back. I didn't let no one touch you. You see, he reminded him of the dedication of that protection that he offered and it would inspire the obedience to God and the revival what about you what's the Lord want to do with you you see we can take that one verse in Genesis we don't have to go no further that one verse how are you taking that one verse and applying it to your life To allow revival to happen. You see, there's a call being made right now in your life. But you have a choice. You can say yes to the call, or you can say no. The Lord may be jumping up and down with both feet on your heart right now, and you know what He's trying to tell you is yes. But you're saying no Let someone else do it. No, not me. No, you don't know what I've done. You don't know. Let me tell you something. The Lord knows what you've done. And the Lord loves you. And the Lord cares about you. And He forgives you as far as the east is from the west. If you're willing to confess it to Him. And give it all over to Him. He wants your answer to be, Yes, Lord, I will go. I will do. He wants to motivate you. He wants to get you out of the rut that you're in. And He wants to get you back on the road. You see, when you get off in the mud and those tires are turning, mud is slinging all over your vehicle or all over your four-wheeler. And it's getting all over you. And it's getting on everything around. And all it's doing is getting everything dirty. And before long, you're going to create some ruts. And then you're going to bottom out. And all your tires are going to do is sit there and spin. And you're going to get nowhere. 
And that might be where you're at right now in your spiritual lives with the Lord. You may be in such ruts that all you're doing is your tires are sitting there spinning and you're just slinging and getting everything dirty around you. This morning it can be changed. The Lord wants to pull you up out of the ruts. He wants to wash off the mud. He wants to wash off the dirt. He wants to get you back on the road that you may get where you need to get. Where He wants you to be led. But here's the thing. He's not going to come get you up out of those ruts until you call upon His name. You see, you can go out there in the places where you're going to go get in the mud and you get stuck. No one knows you're stuck until you call for help. No one knows to come get you out of the ruts until you call for help. No one knows where you're at spiritually in those ruts until you call upon the name of the Lord for help. You have to call for help. You want revival to break out? It's time to call for some help upon the Lord. I can't do it. Brother Robert, he can't do it. Jeremy, he can't do it. But the Lord can. The Lord can. And if you hear this morning, you say, Wes, Lord isn't talking to me. He's not telling me nothing. Do you have a relationship with him? Do you even know him? Have you called upon his name and asked you to forgive? Ask Him to forgive you of your sins and ask Him to come into your heart and be the Savior and the Lord of your life. Because here's the thing. If you have, you have a relationship with Him. And when you have a relationship with someone, you talk with someone. You talk to them and they talk to you. Now you may not hear the Lord verbally in your ears, but you can hear it in your heart. You know what's right. You know what's wrong. You know what you're supposed to be doing. You know what you're not supposed to be doing. You're saying, Wes, that's not happening to me. We need to see if you really got a relationship with him. And this morning, I would love to help you get a relationship with the Lord. But here's the kicker. You got to ask. You got to ask for that help. To call upon the name of the Lord to, to get saved, to have that relationship. You got to ask for help. You know what that consists of doing? Humbling yourself and putting your pride in whatever else is standing in your way that's keeping you from calling upon the name of the Lord. We need revival and we need it bad. We need it like we have never needed it before. Don't be the person that is standing in the way of revival breaking out in this place. And you say, well, Wes, I may be that person. Here's how you can fix it. Ask for forgiveness. And it's fixed. And then be obedient then it's glorified. Let's pray.